welcome. Uh, my name is Adam Miller, for those who don't know. I work on the Fedora Engineering team at Red Hat. I uh, do a lot of things in as much as I can. Uh, most recently, it's been around container build system uh, and automation. Uh, I'm going to talk today about the multi-architecture version of the uh, layered image build system. Uh, and I want to preface that with the fact that I really, really tried to have a live demo for y'all today. Uh, it's just not going to happen. Uh, just didn't end up working. So today's topics, uh, we're going to define containers. I like to do that briefly just uh, for anybody who uh, is new to the topic space, who doesn't have experience in it, um, knows like what on earth this stuff is, what are we talking about. Um, go ahead and specify the difference between base image and layers images, uh, and then why Fedora containers? Like, what what's the motivation? Why are we doing this as a project? Why are we, um, you know, spinning our wheels on this? Uh, and then why multi-architecture containers? Uh, what, why does that matter? Uh, a quick fun history lesson about the container build system within Fedora, uh, and then you know, now to kind of break out where we've come from uh, to now where we are today, and then where we're going. Um, and then we'll get into a little bit of how it's built, uh, and one of the main uh, components it's built with is OpenShift, so we'll define it, we'll go ahead and very briefly describe what that is. Uh, I want to define release engineering just because it helps frame and identify uh, why the system is designed the way it is in certain aspects and why, uh, why certain decisions were made, what the motivation behind some of that was. Uh, and then how does it all work? Uh, how does it all work today, and then how is it going to all work for multi-arch? Uh, because right now the multi-arch stuff um, is uh, in active development in the uh, the Fedora staging environment, so we're uh, we're still still pushing towards uh, towards the goal of having it in production. Um, so very quickly, uh, what are containers? Containers are are generally referred to as operating system level virtualization, <coughs> and what that means is that we can have multi-tenant isolation of processes, and and what we can do is we can more or less forklift uh, software and, and confine it in this space and make that it think that it has a view of the world that it doesn't actually. We can, we can lie to it and say that um, you know when it queries the prop file system, it has its own specific view because it's been namespaced off. We're, we're providing constraints around it um, in order to control it and, and have finer grained uh, uh, restrictions on it. Um, and it also affords us the ability to kind of, you know, wrap that in in whatever kind of abstraction we want. And, uh, and I'll get into a little bit more specifically how we're doing it and the implementations we have. Uh, but <coughs> we kind of get to wrap it in ways that we want to execute various different, uh, you know, effectively platforms on one host. Um, <coughs> So containers are not new. Uh, I will make the argument that the original container was the Cheroot uh, in 1982, and you may or may not disagree with me on that. I will. I will completely admit that it was a very unsophisticated uh, container, but it allowed us to basically take a piece of software and lie to it about the environment in which it was run, the context in which it existed and it executed. Um, it thought they had a worldview of the system that wasn't true, uh, and that's more or less what we're doing with containers. Now they're exponentially more sophisticated these days. Uh, so we have copy and write, we can do quotas, we can do I.O. rate limiting, uh, and all sorts of things. Uh, brief, non-exhaustive history of sophisticated Unix-like uh, container technology. Um, I, I would wager and tip the hat uh, that this started in 2000 with FreeBSD jails. Um, and then Linux V server in 01, Slash zones in 04, OpenVZ in 05. Uh, 08, uh, LXC happened. IBM created a tool set for LXC, which basically was a, a user space uh, tool set that allowed us to talk to and, and uh, have kind of a really interesting grasp on kernel features in Linux. Uh, and that's where I like to think that things got interesting, because that is kind of uh, what, what was the catalyst to a lot of our, uh, our current uh, tools that we have and a lot of the the change in in the way that we are trying to run systems and implement a lot of this stuff. <coughs> so, uh, 2011, uh, systemd n spawn, interestingly enough, did nothing with LXC, uh, but uh, used a lot of the same backend technologies. And a fun fact I always like to tell, n spawn apparently cr was originally created because uh, they wanted a way to be able to test systemd without having to keep rebooting systems. Um, so n spawn is actually a you know it's a kind of a containerized technology. Uh, and then in 2013, .cloud released Docker, later really renamed themselves to Docker Inc. I think that was probably the big one that got everybody uh, really focusing because it provided um, a very low barrier of entry, 
uh, standardized uh, image uh, format and then a way to actually like move these things around uh, and pull pull down these images, run them, destroy them very uh, very ad hoc, very easily. Uh, <clears throat> 2015 Run C was released under the purview of the Open Container Initiative. There is now this uh, documentation out there that defines uh, what a container is, how it should be run, and Run C is a reference implementation of that. Uh, and then 2016 Container D was a Run C orchestration daemon. Uh, all of these things are now how Docker is actually built, or um, Moby, if you're following the upstream component. So. Uh, layered image versus base images. When we get into container world, um, you have layered images and base images, and base images are built from effectively nothing. Um, they start with basically a blank slate. They are, they are, you define a root file system within them with everything you need. Um, and you know, if you want to break it down, you can actually have a single process in that. And, uh, you know, languages like Golang that are statically compiled uh, are kind of making that popular in some use cases, uh, where you can actually have a base image. Uh, that is from nothing and just runs this one process. That's that's valid. But for most people who are transitioning to a container world, what they start with is a base uh, instant, a base image that's based on an uh, operating system distribution that they're used to using. Uh, so what we have in Fedora space is we're going to have a Fedora um, base image that you can then build upon. Um, you know, CentOS or RHEL or you know Debian or OpenSUSE. They are, they're going to have those as well uh, for those people who want to use um, you know alternate. Uh, other distributions than you know than what Fedora is doing, but <clears throat> there's a distinction because you have the base image uh, that is uh, effectively your starting point for building m what I would call more sophisticated applications, um, and and that that's not like a you know kick in the shins to saying that your you know your shell running core utils isn't sophisticated, but if you're trying to run a service and things like that, you're generally going to write that and build it on top of you know, what the, what the base operating system provides. So your base image is going to be the thing that your distribution uh, release engineering group is generally going to produce, and then layered images are what the rest of us are going to build on top of to create things. Uh, and I like the example here that shows that we can basically take a Fedora 25 app, put it on a Fedora 25 base image, and we can move that entity around from a Fedora 25 host to a Fedora 26 uh, host base OS and just run it unmodified uh, as it is. Um, so the reason I pay, I say that as a distinction because what we're talking about from the Fedora layered image build system is we are building images that are layered. Uh, the Fedora base images today are still built in uh, Koji uh, using Image Factory, uh, and that's outside of the scope of this talk. But just know that there is that distinction, and we we have them separate. So why why on earth are we doing this? Um, <clears throat> so why Fedora containers? So we want to enable the ability to deliver Fedora content. Uh, faster to users, um, and the next line item is partially, that's, it's a very vague statement. We want to automatically uh, generate release artifacts with security updates, and, and that, that's very far and wide reaching in the sense that we want to do that across the board, but for the application stacks and the service stacks that we want to deliver, um, that falls under the purview of this, uh, this build system because it allows the ability for all these new deployment types and all these new, um, you know, you've got your green, blue, your red, black, you have these different strategies for deploying things. And, and instead of making the users pull all of our content and build all these things themselves and, and replicate, you know, having a build environment and then having to track dependencies so they can kick off and, and make sure that they always have the latest version and everything, we want to be able to do that on their behalf so they can just get to use it um, just like they would use, you know, a, a DNF update in a traditional system. Um, and then also lowering the barrier of entry for contributors. So. Uh, we currently do a lot of legwork to repackage things over and over again in ways that are already packaged, and that makes a lot of sense <coughs> for a traditional operating system for a traditional Linux distro because of the fact that um, you really don't want to have uh, applications clobber the system. You don't want, um, you know, let's say something that you pip installed or npm installed or ruby gem installed or um, insert thing here uh, <coughs> installed. You don't want that to clobber your system. That makes it very difficult to manage updates, to maintain um, you know, a good manifest of your systems, do you know, relatively standard practice for, for maintaining a large environment. 
However, if we if we take that away from the end system and we put it more into a container, uh, and that container is an entity that is then rolled out into uh, what you would consider an immutable infrastructure to where if you want to do a change or you want to do an update, you don't actually change something on the system. You rebuild that artifact and redeploy it. Um, and then you just simply restart whatever that process is, running a new context of, uh, of whatever the thing you're trying to deploy is. So <clears throat> there are some, some obstacles to actually be able to allow uh, things to be distributed under the uh, the purview or under the flag of, uh, of under the brand of Fedora um, without being uh, packaged uh, originally and uh, we have some plans on how to do that um, and a lot of that will actually kind of fall under you know the reasons that we need to do that will fall under the release engine component I'll kind of round back to that uh, so why multi-arch? Um, <clears throat> we don't just support one architecture today, uh, so that's like the first and foremost, is if we're going to do something as a Fido an official Fedora initiative, I like to believe that we will focus and, and pay attention to all of the things that we, uh, we currently say we will. Um, uh, but also I, I think one of the big ones right now is a, is a very large trend in what's going on in technology is Internet of Things. Uh, and, and not many Internet of Things uh, dev kits or packages or, or you know, um, thing like pieces of hardware that IoT folks are working on are x86-64. There's just not a lot. I mean, most of them are doing something with considerably more low power. Primarily because Intel pulled out a bunch of that stuff. <coughs> I, well, I mean, it, you know, throwing stones and whatnot. Um, what I'll call the magical arm revolution. Um, I don't know if you like spend much time on various RSS feeds that I do. It just seems like they're uh, at least in headlines, taking over the world. Um, you know, they still we we don't have hardware, but whatever. Uh, they'll they'll ship maybe, it. Maybe next year. They'll ship it. You know, next month, every month. Um, but yeah. So in, in the other arch other architectures matter. I mean, there's there's a you know a risk five bring up that's kind of being grassroots half you know, bootstrapped. There's um, there's been uh, kind of a a rekindling of uh, a handful of people's uh, interest in MIPS. Like there, there are other architectures out there. There's a lot of things that people are interested in, and and we don't know what the future holds. If if at some point in the future somebody decides that, you know, architecture X Y Z is going to take over the world, uh, it just seems silly that we would build a system today that would lock ourselves out of being able to adapt to that quickly. So, quick history lesson. Uh, I, I've, if, if anybody's uh, been to any of my talks before about the later image build system, um, some of the content I've gone over already probably looked familiar, and this definitely does because I love to uh, poke fun at and or th uh, put, throw Matt under the bus. <coughs> but the way that the layered image build system happened was Matt Miller said uh, that there's an open source layered image build system uh, and we should deploy one. And uh, he's right. There was one, and we should deploy one. However, uh, there was a misunderstanding uh, of, by both of us that it was done and just needed to be deployed, and we just needed, from the infrastructure standpoint, needed to like make some Ansible playbooks and roll this thing out. Um, we did not, either of us, realize that it was under active development and that uh, we needed to uh, join in uh, its, uh, its continued development and, and uh, help get it somewhere. Uh, for the finish line. Uh, so we did that. <coughs> and then phase one, I would say phase one was probably about 18 months ago. Uh, we had single node builder. We uh, finished that in a few months. Image format, v2, registry v2, manifest v2. Uh, that broke the original implementation. So when v2 rolled out, if anybody's familiar with, with any of the, the um, so what I talked about previously <coughs> um, with, uh, with the way that there's like these standardized ways to have an image created to transport that image. And, uh, and have the metadata about it, that's these things. Well, the specification went from V1 to V2. This was incompatible. Um, universal truths that uh, were true about V1 were not inherently true about V2. And very large portions of the build system had to be rewritten from scratch um, or heavily refactored you know, for the components that were still legitimately you know, useful but just were broken. There was a, you know, a lot of refactoring. So phase two. Let's go ahead and bring it up into the future, grab the V2 manifest, all the different V2 formatting. We'll do a scale-out deployment because, you know, now that we have a better understanding of what we're doing, we can, you know, go ahead and scale this out in a way that will make sense for the future. Uh, automate tests that can be tied to the output of OSBS. 
this is actually done. Nobody uses it, <laughs> but we have, there is a testing mechanism. Uh, I would like to uh, very much so uh, thank Tim Flink, because uh, he worked really hard on this for a very long time, uh, and then nobody used it. Um, so I'm sorry, Tim, but thank you uh, very kindly. Um, <clears throat> and Relinge is able to promote in, in uh, um, I'm sorry, we're able to promote images from, uh, you know, from the candidate registries to production, we have a formal process for that, and there's Koji tags, and things are things are tracked in a in a way that are, are relatively similar to the way that other artifacts in Fedora are. For a while there, there was kind of like a, a special off to the side thing, and, and we're you know we're getting more in line with with the way that release engineering does things. Phase three is what I would say is happening right now. We have image registry scale out that is done. We have multi multi master uh, image registry. It's running uh, on top of cluster storage. Um, search and advertise for image registry. I know if you go to registry.fedoraproject.org right now, you'll get a web UI. I'm sorry. Um, I'm actually helping to uh, track down an individual who I will not name and throw them under the bus on tape, but I'm trying to track somebody down because uh, we just need one patch uh, and they had, they had said that they, they would do it and uh, hopefully we can get that done and merge soon. Uh, CVE and security metadata for updates. Um, that's something that we still want to plan. What's very interesting about containers is um, so basically a tar ball with some metadata, and there's certain metadata that is specified that you need to have, um, but there's a lot that's not. Um, so, uh, like for example, how do you version these things? That's an unanswered question. There's no specification for that. You, you define a tagging strategy that makes sense for you and your team, and you go with it. Um, but it's not universal, it's not ubiquitous, everybody's not going to agree on it. You can't just go to um, you know, somebody else's registry, whether that be the Docker Hub or Key.io or somebody else's and, and search for a thing, let's, I don't know, Postgres, um, and you will probably find, eh, you know, a couple of dozen Postgres, and they might not all be versioned the same, in the same format, in the same way. Um, so that's been, uh, you know, that's an interesting challenge and, and uh, we're kind of working on that stuff. Um, so phase four is going to be orchestrator and worker architecture, and I'll talk about what that means um, and, and why that is important, and then, uh, and then multi-arch. So phase three isn't inherently done yet, but phase four has already begun because of the necessity to, uh, to get moving towards um, the multi-arch truth, uh, and that will also allow us to, uh, to um, take out certain certain components of the build environment that we don't require. Uh, we'll actually, um, yeah, so, um, and because it doesn't inherently affect phase three, like we're not gonna, we're not gonna like put a stop to some of that work. Okay, so uh, very quickly, OpenShift is a container platform built on top of Kubernetes. What is Kubernetes? I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, it has a bunch of advanced features. The only one that we specifically care about is the build pipeline, and uh, I'm sorry, the, the only three that we care about, build pipelines, image streams, and triggers. Um, so a build pipeline is basically a primitive that allows you to pass in some information. OpenShift turns it into a thing they call a build. They build it for you and they spit out some stuff. Um, one of the inputs into that is an image stream. So we talked about how the container registry has this standardized format for how images can be transferred and, and moved around. Well, an image stream uh, basically it is an alias for that that, mo that can monitor it um, for changes and then logs an event. And what's interesting about events, we can trigger actions off of them. So that's where the triggers come in. So one of the things that we're going to have is, is triggers that uh, are used for our various aspects. And um, we could potentially use that for things like generating CVE data and um, that kind of stuff. So uh, we're interested in those things. Fun diagram. Uh, if you look at the green section, build automation, uh, that's most of what we're interested in. Uh, if anybody has questions about all of this stuff, we can we can talk about that later. Uh, it, the main reason I put this up is because I, I did want to point out that there's a lot going on here. OpenShift is a is a very powerful system. Kubernetes is a very powerful system. There's uh, a lot of capability there. Um, and and what's interesting about the layered image build system is we only really are using a very small fraction of, of that capability, but a big reason that we use this is because of the image streams, the triggers, and the fact that it is a, it is a cluster that can be scaled out. So as we've 
as the build system that Fedora is using uh, becomes more popular and we need to put more hardware behind it, uh, it's pretty easy. We can just keep adding more nodes behind um, behind the orchestrator and, and it'll, it'll span uh, to our heart's content. Um, and I say that and I think, I mean, I think there's, what, thousand node, I think there's thousand node systems now and we have a three node system. So we got room to grow, we'll be fine. Um, so really quick, Kubernetes overview. Uh, you have uh, master and nodes, um, and this is what I was talking about. So <clears throat> when you run uh, a container inside of Kubernetes, you have this idea of a pod, container runs inside of a pod, uh, and that's where our builds will run. So we schedule this unit of work inside this pod, and our builds run there. Um, and then uh, the, the master is where the orchestrator happens. So when we need to scale out, and we need more build capacity, we need to be able to run more of our build pods, we can just add more node hosts behind it uh, and scale out there. And the reason that this, uh, did I, nope, ah, I put them out of order, sorry. Um, we're gonna skip that slide, I'll come back to it. Um, so, um, OSBS <coughs> is built on top of OpenShift Origin, so if you look, um, inside, I don't have a laser point, that'd be nice. Um, <coughs> if you look inside uh, OpenShift's, uh, or inside of the OSBS thing, OSBS is the OpenShift build service. It is, uh, it is a thing that uh, puts together various components to create uh, a custom build type that we feed into OpenShift. So OpenShift is one component. We add some things to it and we create what we call a build root. Um, and that is where the build actually happens. So uh, we take advantage of the build primitive. <coughs> we rely on OpenShift for the scheduling and orchestration. Uh, we enforce the inputs come from known valid uh, places. So uh, we can't, so if you try to create a, a build that just does a curl pipe to bash, um, we will we will probably fail that build because uh, we have we have actually you know resources that we green light. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Why? Thank you. Ooh, that's fancy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then we have a build root, and our build root is our build root is a limited uh, Docker runtime. So for everybody familiar with doing uh, RPM builds in Koji. Uh, this is going to be kind of a similar idea of a build route for that. This is the minimal set of tools that are required to be able to actually run the other set of tools that are needed to perform the build that you have asked of the system. And, and we create that and that is the baseline of every, uh, of every build and every pod that goes on inside the cluster. So uh, it's, we, and we firewall constrain at the Docker, Docker bridge interface. Uh, and that's how we actually do our, our isolation for various inputs, is uh, there are known trusted inputs. So for example, uh, you know, disk git in Fedora space is going to be an accepted space. Uh, official Fedora repositories, that kind of stuff. Um, <coughs> inputs are sanitized. If for any reason you pass something that is malformed or misformatted, um, uh, I'm not gonna say it's perfect. You could potentially get around what we've set up, but uh, so far for the most part it's been good. Um, Okay, yep. Do, do, do. Uh, atomic Reactor is another component. Single pass Docker build tool has a lot of really fancy um, features that we really like. And uh, the main ones are the fact that we can, um, we can change the base image and that we can inject uh, repositories. So right now, if for any reason that we need to do like a build override or something, we can actually inject a, another um, source of information to be valid. Uh, so that's the build system. So here's Fedora's implementation as it stands today. Um, <coughs> so we have Fedora layered image maintainers. They interact with Diskit, just like uh, RPM maintainers do. They send a container build to Koji. Koji then kicks it off in OSBS, and then that magically happens in the registry. Let's see if people take pictures, I'll wait. Cool, okay, this is what it's gonna look like. This is what it looks like in stage right now, it just doesn't work yet. Um, <coughs> so this should all look familiar. Um, this, this piece down here is the same, this piece over here is the same. Uh, but what has happened 
is we now have an OSBS orchestrator cluster and then we have worker clusters. And we will have a separate worker cluster for every architecture that we care about. And what's going to happen is Koji is going to kick off a build in the OSBS orchestrator. That OSBS orchestrator will then, in turn, kick off a build for each of the native, each of the um, architectures that we care about. Uh, and then that information will flow back into the orchestrator OSBS, and then that information will flow back into Koji. Um, <clears throat> so Koji will remain our source of truth, and we will get to a place to where, just like today, when you kick off an RPM build, it will build for all the architectures. If you kick off a container build, it will then kick off the builds for all the architectures. Uh, and this allows us, um, I probably should have found some space to say like other architectures down here, but um, I just picked a handful of them for, for demonstration purposes. Uh, these, I'm not saying that these are the three we will support, but um, <coughs> uh, yes? Is it going to be necessary for everything to be RPMs before you can build a container, or will you be able to pass them? Uh, today, yes, it's required. Um, in the future, so that was actually um, a few slides. Somewhere. Yeah, so the lower your barrier of entry for contributors. Um, that's what I was talking about. I probably, I mean, I should have spelled a little bit more, spelled it out a little bit better, but right now, yes, it has to be all RPMs. Um, in the future, one of the goals is for that to be. Um, not true. Well, I mean, the limit is not in OSBS. You can upload into uh, Lucasite cache and unpack it into the doc in Docker file and use it in the limit. Right, no, no, yeah. So it's not a technical limit in OSBS or in the layered image build system. We can technically do that today. We, we currently lock it down to not allow that. Um, because, and, that, and that's actually, so this is a good moment to do the really quick. Uh, what is release engineering? Uh, making software production pipeline that is reproducible, audible, definable, and deliverable. Um, and those attributes we want to uh, maintain true into the future. Those are things that we want to uh, keep um, uh, and not throw away. And one of the big problems and one of the big challenges with allowing uh, things to not come from RPMs is the ability to recreate them uh, in a way that can be audited later in the future. So what we do is in Koji, we have, so for the uh, OSBS, the OpenShift build service, what that happens, what happens there is when Koji kicks off the build, when Koji kicks off the build, when OSBS is done, it has a successful build reported from the, um, the worker node, the orchestrator will then do what's, a, what's called a content generator metadata import into Koji. So all of the metadata that would potentially be needed um, to recreate that build environment, that build route with those specific set of inputs um, is stored in Koji. So Koji is still the, the source of truth. We can realistically at any point in time, once the Ansible playbooks are, are set up and everything and configs are good, we can turnkey destroy OSPS on the back end and just relaunch it and, and, uh, and then we can just keep building. That's the goal. Um, however, the rebuildable part and the, the metadata um, to, to import back into Koji, if we say that we allow things to be able to like pip install or, or go get, so if you, if you did a go get, um, those are pulling things from random places on the internet, and those random places on the internet can disappear. Right. So we lost the ability to truly audit, and we've also lost the ability to recreate. Um, so what we need um, is a way to um, have content streams that are curated <laughs> uh, and what's interesting about that term is um, we have a wiki page somewhere in Fedora that talks about the, the, that exact topic and uh, a way to solve it. Um, I just don't know whatever happened to that project. So uh, at some point in the future, we will find a way to bring that project back to life or we'll start a new one because uh, this is something that we need. Um, yeah. Can I just add real, real quick that <coughs> yeah, this is also partially, there's been work on the OSBS side to support pulling content other than RPMs directly from Koji. Mm -hmm. So if we have a system that is either building or importing Go artifacts into Koji, they could then be pulled directly into a 
Docker can get into a container build in a, such a way that it would be auditable, that a reference to those artifacts would be included in the metadata. Yeah. So, so for, for the yeah, so for the video, one, this line of questioning started because uh, he asked if uh, if we are required to have RPMs built. Um, two, the comment was um, there is currently work ongoing to allow from the OSPS upstream uh, to allow for uh, content sources other than just RPM repos to be injected into uh, the build environment for a container. So we could theoretically get to a point where we can we can then have have that input. There was another yes. Uh, to go with a multi-cluster approach for the different architectures as opposed to, say, having multiple nodes with different architectures in a single cluster and labeling them appropriately and then just using them selected. So, so the question was, is there a reason for having multiple clusters instead of having uh, various nodes with specific architectures um, and just labeling them appropriately and having no, uh, node selectors? And for those who aren't familiar, node selectors is a component of Kubernetes that allows you to query information about your nodes uh, based on labels. Um, yes, uh, the implementation uh, overhead of patching all of Kubernetes to understand uh, architecture awareness uh, was difficult because otherwise Kubernetes would just kind of randomly schedule things to run on nodes of the wrong architecture uh, and that wouldn't go well. Um, so yeah, it was basically from the OSBS upstream, uh, it's a team of I think five people uh, who don't actually uh, have a long tenure of, of hacking on Kubernetes itself, uh, kind of evaluated do we try to implement multi-arch awareness into Kubernetes itself or handle it higher up the stack? And the choice was just to handle it higher up the stack. That's interesting. I think that, I think that problem actually got a little bit better with a couple of the recent releases. Okay. So. Okay, so the comment was that uh, they think the, the problem actually got better within a couple of recent releases. Um, so this work, uh, the, the architecture design for this work started back in January, if that helps frame some of the like time frame of information that was available. Um, I think it could be switched over very easily if there's a better way of doing it. Um, it could be switched over easily if there's a better way of doing it. Uh, I don't know. Because of some of the ways that the uh, bookkeeping work manages between these, um, it would be a decent amount of work to pivot. Uh, I don't know, the, I mean, it seems like, it seems to me at least that if it's designed to, I mean, a lot of the metadata transport is happening in ways that really should be agnostic to that, but I don't, I was just, it was my brief thought that it wouldn't, that it could be switched to the future, but I, I don't um, It probably could be, uh, I just don't know, to the best of my knowledge, it would be non-trivial. Like from, from what I've looked at in terms of the implementation of the orchestrator to worker communication, um, basically the orchestrator just like gives instructions uh, and then kind of like keeps an earmark of I'm waiting for metadata. I'm waiting for I'm waiting for the metadata upload from each of those, um, and then it reports back. But, I mean, I think that the, the idea of worker builds build would stand no matter how that they were. Anyway, I think this is a little bit too detailed. Okay. Um, there was a, yes. Can you? Uh, is there an example this Git repo or package name or whatever that uh, that package container build works in? Just if I want to poke at it and see. Um, yeah, actually, we have an entire um, container namespace in um, in. Oh, so uh, it's not like a standard that has a spec file. No, no, it doesn't have a spec file. We, we it's a Docker file instead. So what, what's like an example? Um, figure. Yeah. Or just stay for the session. I feel like we're in the question and answer space. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. We're we have we've we've wholeheartedly translated the Q and A, and that's totally fine. Uh, there were like two slides left, and they're not important. Um, uh, container. Yeah. So here, container engine. Why not? Um, do do do. Files. Sources. Oh, what? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, what? 
That might be a bad example. Well, no, because I know this is a thing. Like, oh, here we go. We have the uh, developer container engine here saying that it's not a ticker. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but <laughs> all, all of disk it isn't secure now. <laughs> There's nothing that. <laughs> But if you really want to know more about this, see for the next one. That is the Fedora project. Uh, it's running an instance of Tiger. Uh, yes, question over here. We're still on your question. You, uh, was that was that good? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's so. It's also, he's filling in. Cool. Fed Packers Code Container slash Cockpit is an example. Yes. Um, I maintain that. It's a little outdated. Uh, I need to update a couple things yeah, on it. Just it's not perfect. But we do have we do have container guidelines. Um, so we actually have, uh, so if you go to um, container uh, guidelines. So we have a review process and guidelines um, for for all of that, just like we have for RPMs. Um, the verbosity of our guidelines are considerably lesser than that of RPM. Uh, we're still figuring out as we go because, like I said, there are no there are no definitions for what this stuff has to be. Uh, so we just kind of try to work amongst various communities and and gather as much consensus as possible and say that that's how it should be done. But if people want to know more about that, they can say this. Yes, that is actually a really good transition and a good plug. If you are interested in that, directly after this, we have a workshop on how to become a container maintainer in Fedora. Uh, Josh Burkus uh, and myself will be doing that right here in like 20 minutes. Yes, Troy. Um, so how do you, you got your container, you have three arches. How does somebody say, I want arch 64 or no? You just pull it. So you can use something like Scopio or Docker or whatever, and um, you just pull it because we'll have we'll have manifest list implementation. So if you are on an x86 machine, it'll pull x86. If you're on an AR64, it'll pull AR64. Doesn't actually work with Scopio currently, but it will. So if I do if I do a Docker pull, Dan, where you at, man? Why is why? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. What try? So if I do a Docker pull, let's say I just have Docker. Yeah. It, uh, so, so the, the original question. I'm sorry. The original question was um, how how would somebody know how to get the appropriate architecture um, uh, once we have multiple architectures building? And the answer is um, the manifest list in the registry should uh, make it such that you will just Docker pull uh, like F26. Well, let's let's say F27. Like you'll you'll Docker pull F F27 slash. Um, I don't know HTTPD, um, and and then it will it will negotiate with the registry what architecture you're on and, and pull the appropriate one. Um, I think it actually provides it metadata in the post now, like when it or uh, the get when it when it does the get, it will be a parameter. Cool. Question. Uh, I have actually a positive question. So do I have to maintain one Docker file per architecture? Uh, the question is, do I have to main one, maintain one Docker file per architecture? Uh, the answer is no right now. Um, it should just be like with a spec file. Uh, you just have your one and we feed it through. Uh, the, the kicker there is if, if, we, if we find somewhere in the future that there are oddities that don't work on one architecture and we have to find workarounds, that could change. But no, the plan right now is, is just, just the one. Question? Yeah. What do I need to do to get you? So uh, the question was, how do how do we get using Builda instead of Docker? Um, and the answer to that is, uh, we already have a plugin for it. We just need to switch to it, and uh, and that is on my roadmap for Fedora's OSPS instance. I will speak for nobody else's OSPS instance, but uh, yeah, we will be doing that. And if 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 Dan, if that is not done by DevConf. Um, I will owe you an explanation. I have kind of a vaguely related question. So it seems like a lot of a lot of containers uh, from like packages, the Docker file is literally just like install package and possibly set entry point depending on if there's an obvious entry point. Is there is there any is there a reason that you need to in those cases you need to have a Docker file at all? Is there a reason we can't just use some of the, the APIs that like Builder uses, for instance, to kind of automatically 
produce a container that just contains? Uh, so the, the question is, some, some of the Docker files are basically just DNF install and then provide an entry point for whatever that thing that was installed. Um, and the, the follow-up question, or I guess the, that was the statement, and the question was, uh, is there any reason that we will do we should necessarily do that as opposed to um, just allow people to use things like build a and, and, and just define what they need and, and build but, it? I mean, like, it seems like in, in those cases, right, you can kind of almost assume an implicit Docker, Docker file, but, you know, not actually need to maintain a separate repository that has virtually the same Docker file across the seven. Um, well, yeah, I mean, basically, okay, so what we need to do for that scenario is ba we would have to define the set of, of things that we want to just be the the DNF install of that package and then an entry point, and then we would have to have a, uh, a uniform defined entry point that, each, that we would have to then supply for each one of those things. Um, we could do that. It's just a matter of, of somebody defining what that set of RPMs is that will be containerized um, somebody writing those entry point scripts, uh, whether because it could just be a command, but uh, that is supplied by the RPM, or it could be a script that we have to provide, um, and then three, somebody writing the system that would like tie it all together. Um, but the way that it's set up now, and the idea behind it, is that we have like this one uniform process that will cover all the bases that we need. Um, I'm not against changing it. That's up to the Atomic Working Group to do as they please. Might um, be personally like, yeah, why not? Let's let's change the world. Um, a lot of this stuff is, I mean, I, all of this stuff is made up as we go. So, I mean, if you if you have proposals for for how to change it, I'm all I'm all in. Like, it's just uh, this was this was kind of proposed as the way to to like get moving. And, and that's how we're doing it. And the other thing too is like, so let's say you do have HTTPD as your starting and your entry point, um, and then you want to use that as like the base image for um, some, to build another layered image to inherit that one. Because that's another thing too is you can actually create a layered image from a layered image, and you can yeah. you can you know daisy chain up that, um, and you know that just because of your container background. But you know just that's that's a you know a point for a lot of people that. That affords us new possibilities and those kind of things. So, um, but yeah, I, I I think that it, it would make a lot of sense. But I think ultimately, in a lot of ways, uh, once we have the FreshMaker integration into this stuff, that won't matter because FreshMaker is going to be doing all that stuff for us anyways. Oh, I'm sorry. FreshMaker was from the previous talk. Um, it's a magical system that's part of Factory Shadow that uh, automatically kicks off, it automatically triggers builds within the environment based on uh, changing of content. Yes? Uh, we have six minutes. Uh, we can make it generate. <laughs> it doesn't today, no. Okay. So multi-arch multi question. Yes. Right now, for our container definition, our yep. arch is a tag. Yes. Arch is a label. And right now we've been putting x86.64 in there. Yes. Is there going to be a separate definition file for each architecture? Or for packages that are available in all architectures, can we define a generic one? The answer that earlier. Yep. Yeah. Well, I didn't explicitly. Like, I didn't call that out explicitly. Um, so the question, so the, the statement was, currently today in our guidelines, we have a definition of the architecture. And currently, we define it as x86 underscore 64. Uh, the question is, in the future, we're going to have to define that explicitly for each one. The answer is no. I think we will go the route of RPM uh, in the sense that if you, we will remove the requirement to define that. And uh, we'll actually have to patch Koji container build um, to remove the requirement of that. Uh, and, and it will default to some value. However, if you need to specify only certain architectures, we will then, in that case, that we'll you know, introduce that because, just like in you know RPMs, we can do an exclude arch or explicit define arches. We'll want to do similar thing for for container builds, just because um, that uh, is an unfortunate reality sometimes. You know, for example. Uh, like there is no Docker on PowerPC 64. There is on LE on Little Endian, but not on you know. So PPC 64, you can't build Kubernetes or OpenShift today because they rely on Docker. So I mean, you know, there's just there's going to be certain things that we have a requirement. Question. You almost answered my question. I was just starting to ask. What's the limits on those things? Because uh, 
So you have to have OpenShift be able to build before you can build on each of those architectures. Um, the works. question is, what is the limit on those things? Do I have to have OpenShift be able to build? Like in other words, op OpenShift right now doesn't build on Tower PC 64 LE. It, it does. does. I have it. Okay, it technically does. It's not supported. Yeah, I, I know that a lot of what we're going to do is not supported. That's kind of what we do in Fedora. Oh, okay. So 32-bit ARM is not technically supported by OpenShift Tower. Yeah, 32-bit. I mean, nothing but x86-64 is technically supported by OpenShift Origin. Well, in CentOS, we got the Arch 64 built in. Right. Yeah, I mean, we've had, and we've had that building in Fedora for ages, and, and IBM has contributed Z series support as well. Yeah. So we so in Fedora. Uh, so let's actually. Oh, okay. So you're going good. I've got S three ninety X. I've got yeah. So we've got. Yeah. Power. Power sixty four. Does it work? Yeah. Well, as long as you got it to build, right? Yeah. Oh, so we've got AR sixty four. Well, you need to build it the first phase. So. Uh, Troy, right, we've got AR64, RV7 HL, I686, uh, PowerPC64, Little Endian, X8664, um, and then what is it? S390. S390. Is it dot? Yeah. Koji? No, no, but if you go to the F27, F27 build, you'll have S390, because I think you just went to an F26 build. I did, you're right. Yeah, so F27. Yeah, so if you see, yeah, and you'll see S390X in there as well. Yeah, S390X. Yeah, so we, we're building for everything right now. That's awesome. So who do I talk to about? Oh, let me get that on CentOS. But anyway. Uh, me. Oh. Yeah. Um, I, I've got I've got a handful of patches to the uh, OpenShift build scripts to make it work. Um, I didn't end up having to patch OpenShift itself, but the like all the like ten thousand lines of bash because. Yeah. Apparently, everybody in Kubernetes and Golang like just hates make files. We're like, it's the lineage of that's been working for you for twenty years. We hate everything. What's up? I use Bash instead. Right. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, actually, just I mean, let's since since we're talking about it. Sorry, I didn't open up that can of worms. That's fine. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's actually, it's, I mean, it's, it's an impressive, uh, thing, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's like a whole, I mean, there's, there's lib, like, there's a whole namespaced, uh, so let's say, like, binaries, um, yeah, so if you look at, like, the, the functions, like, there's, like, function definitions that are namespaced, there's, like, OS, colon, colon, build, colon, colon, binaries from targets and stuff, and, like, there's a lot of this, and it works well, like, I'm not gonna knock it, except it's just, Difficult to debug when it fails <laughs> because, I mean, anyone in the room who's ever attempted to debug, a, a, you know, an overly sophisticated Bash script will attest to the fact that it's just hard sometimes. Um, and I mean, the, Kubernetes does this. Like OpenShift does this because Kubernetes does this. And why reinvent the build system because the project you're based on already has one. Um, so yeah, I don't knock them. It's just like <laughs> I've I've fought this thing enough that I, you know. Have a little, little personal, care, little personal uh, care about the pain. Um, yeah. So the the answer to the question is, uh, we will build on everything that we can. We have one minute. Anyone? Any last questions? Cool. Thank you. All. Thank you.